everyone. Thank you so much for being on another yet exciting program of conversation with an alum. And today we have a big fish in the house, Mr. Rex Emojiti Aniboro. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Aniboro. Uh, okay, Aniboro, yeah, Adigoro, yeah. Thank you yes. so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, but today we'll be looking at the topic, empowering communities, exploring the journey of an activist and social entrepreneur in civic engagement and civic society. Yes, uh, Mr. Rex, we are so delighted. Uh, but before we dive into the main conversation for today, uh, mm -hmm. it is important that we read your brief bio so that our participants here will meet. All right, I am reading Rex bio right away. Uh, Mr. Rex, Emojiti Aniguru, an activist, musician, and social entrepreneur, is an Orobo, uh, is an Orobo who hails from Ugeli, not local government area of Delta State. He finished from the prestigious government college Ugeli and Red Law at the Ambrose Ali University, Ekboma, Edo State. He finished from the sorry, uh, active race. Res, uh, in year yes. 2000 and 2010, alumnus of the International Visitors Leadership Program, a United States Exchange Program. He is an associate of the International Dispute Res Resolution Institute, IDRI, and a certified Kingian nonviolence facilitator educator from the Emory University at uh, Atlanta, Georgia. He is the founder and executive director of the Advocates of the Global Goals and Citizen Greater Good Initiative, AGG, AGGCGGI, and spokesperson of the Niger Data People Salvation Front, NDPSF, activist race, is currently the senior special assistant to the Data State Governor of Civic Engagement. And civic society having served in same capacity in the last administration of Senator Dr. Ifayin Otto Okowa. He is married to Jemima and they are blessed with three children. One is called Jesus, the second one is Zala and Jehu. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's put our hands for the Rex. Let's put our hands yes, for Rex. Rex, thank you so much for being on our thank program. You so much. I've been I believe that in the course of reading your bio, uh, there could be some other important items I was unable to pick. And yes. we'll, be happy, we'll be happy if you can just uh, keep the conversation, giving us uh, maybe a little more information about your person, and then we'll dive into the conversation proper. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, uh, for the purpose of introduction, the, the bio is uh, OK, because I think other part of me that I've, that I've, that I've not been expressed in that uh, brief uh, uh, that resume will be given expression uh, during the conversation. Uh, so I think uh, for the purpose of this, that is good enough, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for being on our program today. Um, let's quickly dive into the conversation proper. Uh, Please, uh, for those of you who have questions online, please just uh, keep sending in your questions. Uh, we'll take them much later. But before now, let's try to engage uh, Mr. Rex from this end, please. I hope that you will enjoy this session with us. Uh, Mr. Rex, uh, the first question I want to ask uh, that will also help our viewers to understand uh, a lot much about you is uh, and what you do is what inspired you to become an activist and social entrepreneur. So Rex, can you hear me? Yeah, no. Did you get the question, or do I need to take that again? Hello? Yes, did you get the question? I need to take that again. I, I didn't get the question, please. 
All right. Uh, the question is, uh, what inspired you to become an activist and social entrepreneur? Okay. Um, it's very, very simple, sir. Uh, my life, basically, I've been a life of uh, activism, so I can say from um, even as a child. Uh, growing up, you hear stories from your father and your mother telling you about the little things you did as a child growing up, uh, which suggests to you probably that this is who you have been, or maybe it's a trajectory that uh, is better the, with you. Uh, my father used to tell me that in, uh, in my early days, I always refused to put on one shirt. I will always insist to put on two shirts because I call myself uh, the people's police. And I was a police and all of that. And that uh, anytime they put on, they put me on one shirt, it was always uh, chaotic. And then uh, I will always complain. And so, Hello, Mr. Rex, can you hear me? I think we lost him again. Uh, hello, Mr. Rex. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, please go on. So I, I, my, my life uh, began that way. And uh, for me, I think that has been uh, my little beginning. And so I grew up having these inquisitive uh, tendencies, always wanted to ask the questions. And I asked what somebody would consider a very ridiculous question at a very young age. Uh, it's very ridiculous to say, but it forms part of me. One day, I was so curious because as a child going to church, I was so curious, and I asked a question to my dad. I asked him, and so I always see Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in videos and TVs putting on robes. Uh, was it that at that time, they were also putting on pants? Did Jesus Christ wear pants? My father roared with a wild laughter, uh, and my family, they said, you are very mischievous. I can't be thinking about Jesus Christ wearing pants and all of that. I said, no, because I just wanted to find out if at that time these people were wearing panties or they were just putting on robes. Are they like us or were they, were they alien? Now, what I'm trying to say is that from childhood, I've been an inquisitive mind. I've been one who wanted to ask questions, who wants to know how things are being done and if things are being done correctly. And so uh, that is exactly what my trajectory has uh, uh, been uh, uh, growing up. So, thank you. Uh, I, I, at a younger age, I, at a younger age, I joined the children's choir, where I became the the uh, assistant uh, choir master in church, and from there, I went to school, secondary school, and I became an adjutant in the Nigeria Army Cadet, where you enforce order, you enforce rules, and then when I was in SS one. That was when I cut my teeth during the uh, SAP, must, uh, SAP must go protest. I joined in the protest. And then uh, when it came to the time we had uh, uh, the June 12th uh, debacle, I led the June 12th debacle from the student's angle. And we led protests in the streets of Ugeni for June 12th. That is my beginning of knowing that I, I was doing a lot of things that I did, could not define at that time, but as I grew in life, I became it, it became clear that my path was already created for me to be an activist, one who would want to see change happen in every given society, every given environment that he found himself. That is the situation, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe that uh, a lot of people will be inspired uh, by every word you actually spoke out there today. Um, so quickly, let's move on. Uh, could you describe some key milestone in your activism and social entrepreneur journey? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Can you Hello? Hear me? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, my question is, could you describe 
some key milestones in your activism and social entrepreneur journey so far? Wow, uh, I, I would I wouldn't be able to say what the milestones are, but I I should be able to say firstly that I remember uh, as a young equity person, I founded the Niger Delta Christian Youth Movement. In my founding the Niger Delta Christian Youth Movement, I saw at that time that the elections in Nigeria uh, were said not to be very credible, and even the president at that time. Uh, uh, the late Yadwa uh, did convey, convey the election, what's it called, Electoral Reform Committee. And I told myself that I was going to present a paper at that uh, committee in Abuja. So I left for Abuja, having nowhere to stay, having no one, but I took the risk to go. But before I left, I went to see a blessed memory now, Senator Fred Brumet. And I told him I wanted to go and present my paper that I needed to make my voice heard in this convergence. And he gave me his car and we left. Now, when I got to that convergence, I delivered the paper. And when it was during the break time, I saw two persons I had communication with, I had to have conversation with. Uh, her name was uh, Christy Hemberg. And I said, I'm Rex Anigoro, uh, the... Uh, president of the Niger Delta Christian Youth Movement. And she said she's Christy Emberg of the American consulate. She was a political officer. I told her my story, what we have been doing, how we've been going from school, dissuading people from gang fights and giving scholarship to EDJ students and all of that. She said she was interested in my story at that time. And then uh, she said she was going to invite me all over to her office. But a week later, I saw a mail from her saying that, you should go to the U.S. consulate in Lagos. They were waiting for you uh, to hear your story and to see what you are doing and to hear what you are doing. And so I left for um, Lagos again with my team and we met with Helena Strada. It was from that moment she said to me that we need to bring you on for the IVLP. I didn't know what the IVLP was. And then she said, the story you have given to us so far qualifies you to be an IVLP. And so uh, I'm going to take you up to become an IVLP. And a year later, I saw myself in the United States of America. And that, again, is another milestone because, like you did introduce me, I'm the Senior Special Assistant to the Governor of Delta State on civic engagement and civil society. If there is any reason why I became an appointee of government, it was because I became an IVLP. Because uh -huh. my own program during the IVLP was civic activism and NGOs. And so when the governor, his excellency senator, Dr. Ifai Atokowa, asked me, what can you do with government? I said, take me to the field where, at the place where I was trained by the Americans, civic engagement and civil society. And that is how I became first special assistant to the governor on civic engagement and civil society in the year 2016. I came back in 2019 to become the senior special assistant on civic engagement and civil society. And now again, uh, in the month of August, 2023, I was asked to go back to that position again by the governor of Delta State now, uh, right honorable elder, Sheriff Francis Oborewari. So I consider my going to Abuja, meeting with Chrissy Hemberg, a meeting with Elena Schroeder, then going for my IVLP, and now, my IVLP resulted to my portfolio in impacting the data community, data state, and the Niger data as a very clear milestone in this whole process. Yes, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, your experiences. Um, and I want to believe that it is out of the fact that you are a performer, and that is why they keep calling you back, that look, um, this job you are doing has been so excellent. We've been feeling the impact. Uh, they've been seeing a lot of progress in the area, and I believe that is why they keep calling on you to come back. But quickly, uh, let, you've, been, you've said so much about your IVLP experience. Please, can you tell us um, your journey to the U.S.? Uh, what briefly, just briefly, I know how it is sometimes, but did, did you visit a couple of states in the United States? What was the experience like? My, my, my experience was wow. It was a beautiful experience because for the first time, 
I was living for the United States of America. I've never been there before. Sometimes I dream to see myself in America. And then all of a sudden, I saw myself going to America. And what I used to see in my dream was what I was not seeing. And it, from the day I left Nigeria to the U.S., and from the time I came back, it was beautiful. And yes, we visited a lot of, uh, of four states, uh, four states yeah, from Washington, D.C. Uh, we left for uh, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. I was in a, uh, in a Georgia and then was in Miami. Uh, these were the four areas I traveled to. But clearly, we were meeting with people in line with what our projections were. And one of the places I went to that really was fascinating for me was in Austin, Texas. Uh, yes, Austin, Texas, rather, Texas, not Georgia. Austin, Texas, where I met with the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas. And the information they gave to me in that meeting and the materials they gave to me in that meeting formed greatly what influenced me in 2011 when during the elections in Delta, I became uh, one of the young people who stood seriously for good, uh, for, 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 for uh, uh, credible elections. And guess you what? I was shot severally. Uh, some said about 150 bullets, some said 80 bullets uh, or whatever. But God, by his mercy, I did not die in that shootout with uh, the police who were told that I was, a, I was a gun carrier, I was a ballot chaser, just because we had the anti-rigging volunteers who ensured that rigging could not take place anywhere in the elections. And so my experience in Austin, Texas, on resisting uh, what was wrong, using civil methods, it's very, very key. And I mobilized young people to ensure that their units and their wards were properly safeguarded. There was internal vigilance to ensure that nothing was stolen. And I became an issue, and that resulted to my shooting. And then I went to court, and I was released unconditionally because they saw that what they had against me was frivolous, was a blackmail. And I knew that when you stand up for something right, it is not always easy. You will meet with the opposition to what you believe in. And sometimes it could be costly and it could claim your life. And that is where the story of Martin Luther King, Malcolm S, and all their eggs become very, very, very strong in my voyage so far. Thank you so much. I can just barely imagine what you have been through in the course of activism. And... Uh... That takes us quickly to how do you balance your social and entrepreneurial goals while maintaining a strong commitment to civic engagement? Well, I see is a lot of balance with civic engagement and social entrepreneurship because social entrepreneurship becomes a tool in advancing civic engagement, bringing the people in the communities, bringing the people, um, either when I use what community at this time, either in a given place or as an interest uh, uh, group or whatever, bringing them to a common ground uh, to advance their greater good. I, I say this because when I became the senior special assistant to the governor of Delta State, I discovered that in Delta State, uh, we didn't have a, a, something like an umbrella body or a clear uh, body that government can engage with uh, or, so, or civil society in the state where you can, so, okay, these are the leaders, and then you can have conversations, engagements for the good of the state. And so what I did was to speak with leaders of civil society and NGOs in the state, and then told them that if government must take your respect uh, more seriously, and then there must be conversations where we can complement, supplement, and even need be confront government, there must be a clear leadership of the civil society. And so in 2020, in the wake of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, I have to ensure that a civil society leadership is put in place in Delta State that 
the government can interface with, can engage with, and then we can look at common issues that affect the community. And that is why during the COVID uh, pandemic, Delta State became one of the states that the palliative sharing did not bring out issues like we saw in many states because of the active involvement of the civil society in monitoring the sharing of the palliative to the most vulnerable people. They ensured that the palliative got 90% of the people that it was supposed to go to because of my engagement, because of the creation of a respectable uh, 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 platform for engagement between government and the civil society. And so that was how we created the community of civil society in Delta State to help in advancing the common good. And last year, during the flood, the civil society again were on hand to do advocacy, to go to the people where the IDPs, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the vulnerable people, and also help in educating them, this, their students, helping in medicals and every other thing that could make life a little bit more better for them. It was because we organized ourselves in that manner. And like you know, social entrepreneurship is not about profit making, it's about adding value to people. And then we saw that, okay, if this is what you were doing, we could bring you in first and foremost to add value to the people and not just to make profit. So that is how we've been able to, so I see that it is just five and six, social entrepreneurship and activism, help in bringing life, uh, bringing uh, the, uh, better life to the people in the communities. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. Um, and also, I believe that in the course of being an activist, I believe that over time, uh, especially after you returned from the United States, I believe that the way you have the, the the way you used to do things in the past has relatively changed compared to now. Uh, I believe that it, there has been a change in thought process and how, and and probably a change in your ideas on how to actually do this in the better way. Have you noticed any change over time since you returned from the IVLP program? Has there been any? I, I didn't get that change? Thing. Hello, can you hear me? I had to take a positive change, but I didn't get the question, please. Okay, I, 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 my question is, I was trying to know um, what kind of change have you seen since you returned from the IVIP program? I believe you have your modes of operations in the past, which were a bit quite yes. different compared to after your IVIP program. Do you think that the IVIP program has actually shaped your, your ideas on how to go about this? Very, very, very seriously because prior to my uh, my uh, going for the IVLP, I was much more rustic. I would say, you know, in data, we say data not the carry last. I, I was very, uh, would I call it what you say, hot body? Like what my governor would describe me then. I, I, I could decide to take the bullets, I could decide to face you head on, and sometimes uh, our use of of our language could be abusive. But I discovered that no, if you must bring change to society, the change must begin with you. And we must be the change that we seek to see. And so in our approach, our communication, our strategy, it has to have a human face. It has to be pro people. The, the, the use of nonviolence uh, uh, mechanism became enforced because immediately after my IVLP, graciously, uh, Barrister Alan Oyema of the Foundation for Ethnic Harmony of Nigeria took me back to the United States uh, two months after my return from IVLP to train in the art of nonviolence, peace building, and uh, 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 conflict reconciliation. Uh, he did not call it conflict re uh, resolution, but conflict reconciliation. As a couple with my IVAP and my training by Alan Oyema, who I was graciously introduced to by the political officer of the American embassy who recommended me then for the IVAP, uh, Elena Strada, helped me to form a better way of engaging on issues. Uh, and also to know that you must seek now not to fight the people doing evil, but to attack the causes and the root causes of the evil. And so IVAP gave me 
a better understanding what view and how to handle social issues where there are conflicts, what to say, how to go about it, and not that biggest spirit that we used to have, the rustic way. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was actually hilarious. Um, quickly, um, so how do, let's take this question. So how do you engage and mobilize individuals and communities in civic activities? We all know that it's actually quite very, very difficult uh, because uh, mobilizing people and ensuring that they do, they behave in an orderly manner and all of that. How do you go about that? How do you manage all of that? When, 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 when I came in first as special assistant to the governor of Delta State and knowing fully well that my trajectory cannot uh, be said to be complete or without the IVLP, I created, uh, I, I, I made, I, I formed the Delta State Civil Society Volunteers, which is now requesting Delta State Civic Engagement and civil society volunteers made up of young people, young people within the ages of 15 and even up to 50 were members of that um, uh, volunteer. I made a call calling on Deltans to join this group for leadership development, for advocacy, uh, for, for, for all of those thematic issues the civil society can engage in, social justice, human rights, climate change, environmental good, this, uh, sustainable development goals and all of that. And we had a lot of young people who joined in. Let me say that one of the people who joined with me at that time and who is also here right now, uh, Igbiraja is uh, uh, comrade Igbiraja is here, Seremu, was nominated by me to go for his own IVLP in 2017 using the module of what I learned in IVLP to run and organize the data set civil society volunteers. Uh, the American, the, uh, the consular of uh, the, the US mission was impressed with what I was doing with the data state civic engagement and civil society volunteers and asked me to recommend somebody from the group to attend the IVLP uh, training of which I, uh, uh, um, I nominated Igbera Jaseremu, who went in 2017 and has been back and doing great things since then. And so that is another incentive to uh, leadership development for young people, uh, uh, capacity building for them in the area of their, uh, of their thematic area and goals. And so mobilizing them uh, was through a clarion call on Deltans. And they came just like Jesus would do. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And one of them is Johnny Zobo, uh, who, is, who became a community youth leader and is doing well in the community today, leading a lot of youth where you will say the community is restive and now is bringing peace uh, to that place where gang fights are now begin to be uh, uh, reduced to the barriers. And many others like Uba, uh, Michael, many young people who have gone through this leadership uh, uh, training process. And so we mobilize them because when we train you, we ask you, go and train others. And so it becomes a chain uh, uh, training a program that brings a lot of young people together. That is how we'll be going on mobilizing young deltas. And with the use of social media, it has been wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. Um, for our participant across our network of American spaces, for those who want to ask questions, please uh, use the virtual hand to indicate that you have a question and we'll give an opportunity to ask our speaker uh, your question directly. Uh, let me give it, let's, let me give it, let's take one more question then uh, we can get our participant to engage you fully. Uh, it's just a follow-up question. Considering how difficult it is, especially in this part of the world, I begin to wonder, how do you motivate young people on this course? How do they get motivated? Do you pay them money? Or do you just talk to them and they get convinced about your ideas? 
about the change that you want to see? How do you go about all of this? I'm actually curious, just like most of our participants across Nigeria who wants to know, do you pay them money or do you just speak to them and they get convinced? I, that it's I, I have money? never paid any one of them at any time for standing for the causes that they believe in. I've always impressed it on them that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. When you give, you are making a life. And that's why when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I say, I make lives for a living. For example, I'm in Lagos and I was actually on the road coming to the center, but I had to stop by the way to engage here. The young man who drove me from Delta, Johnny Zobo, has been doing this with me for some time without being paid. He has committed himself to this cause because they believe in doing so, they develop their leadership, which in turn improves their, pers their person, that adds value to their life, which they now use for other causes beyond the volunteer. So they see it as a training ground for them to step higher. As I speak with you, one of our volunteers, who is a deputy coordinator, is aspiring to become a local government chairman in my own local government area. He could not have thought of this if he had not been developed in leadership to know that I can do it. And even if I contest and I do not win, I have developed myself. So they see it as a development platform for them to take on life. In fact, it's an empowerment module for me to say, look, empowerment is not just about the resources or services you render, but about how you can form a strong character personality to bring about the social change that you desire. And you become the catalyst for those changes that you seek. I keep on saying that we must be the change that we, we seek to see. It must begin with us. Somebody said, we always want to change the society, but nobody wants to change their lives and the way they go about living their lives. And so the volunteers that work with me see this as a place for developing those skills that you may never get from the four walls of the university or from what you learn as a trade. Thank you so much. We already have our hands up uh, across our spaces. Um, we will go we'll go forward to pick uh, Oshogbo over to you now. Oshogbo, please unmute yourself and speak. You are muted, Oshogbo, unmute and speak. After Oshogbo, we are going to take Uyo, then we'll go to Kefi, then we'll move to Sokoto. Oshogo, you are muted. We can't hear you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much. I am impressed with the profile of our facilitator this morning. I want to ask that what is your advice to some of our youth, youth of nowadays? Mm -hmm. I am letting most of what you have done. Some are high dues, most especially in the aspect of courage and the skill acquisition. But I'm so impressed with all this uh, catalog of uh, you know, activities. What would be your advice to some of them? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think. Uh... We need to commit as our young people. The last time I, I did the American Corner in Ikeja, and I must say thank you to my dear sister and friend, uh, my sister Stephanie Adesaya, for providing me this opportunity once again to engage. In one of my engagements, I brought her like this to speak with young people in Delta State. Uh, which was well attended, a Zoom engagement, a virtual engagement like this, where a lot of young people, a lot of volunteers 
uh, participated. But when I was with her in, uh, uh, in, in, at, in Lagos, I, I, I shared with her one of the things I intend to do in the days coming, and that is anti-gang fights and crimes and substance abuse. I said in Delta State, in the part of the Niger Delta, and in Lagos State, substance abuse, cyber crime, and gang fights, which we call courtesy, is rising increasingly. And a lot of young people are paying the supreme price for this. And one of the things I discovered is that we have too many young people without guidance. A lot of young people are left to pro on the street without parental guidance, because just like somebody said some time ago, if we are not careful, in the next 20, 30 years, we are going to find children having fathers who are addicts, who are near imbeciles because of substance abuse. And then we are going to have a deformed future, a deformed society. And so the need to ensure that there is a lot of guidance, which of course I believe that the American space is doing for Nigeria already, needs to increase. We need to increase advocacy in the area of getting our young people to a place of guidance. Now they are resistant to guidance. They don't even accept the, those who, who are even under the roof of their parents are no longer being guided because of economic realities and because of resistant culture. So I think the advice should go to us more, to do much more, to find ways in guiding young people uh, from devices that seek to accipiate their future. And then for those who seek to do well in this direction, we need to train them quickly so that they can become the examples that others will see. They, be, they become the influencers that we see. Today on TikTok and everywhere, the influencers that rule, that have more followership, are those who do what we consider to be vice in society. And so where are the change makers that we are raising to take over the spaces? I think we need to do more in getting more people to become change makers and become the role models for our other young people. It's a duty on us. Thank you so much for sharing that wonderful thoughts with us. Um, let's go to, we are, we are over to you, please. Unmute yourself and speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Okay. Only of Wakobiro, my name is Ufoba from Uyo Window. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's good to have you. I've, um, I've known you on social media, and I was surprised when um, on American Spaces they now post you as um, the, uh, at the alum we'll be speaking with. And I was surprised because I've always seen you as a street person. And I appreciate the fact that after your visit to the US, you now had to get that picture of um, not this um, area thing and worry not the carry last because taking the bullet won't give you what you're taking, what you uh, won't give you this result because I've always seen you as a street person. And from what you said, I know um, your background is from Mugeli. From personal experience, I would say I've seen more still needs to be done in, in Ugeli because from some not too long ago experience, we had issues, community issues that until youths were killed before they stopped. So they are still with this um, worrying the carry last mentality and taking a bullet is just all about it. So in all that you've been doing, in all you said you've done, please, I want you to still remember your roots Ugeli needs more to be done because we don't want a situation whereby lives will have to be lost before um, they, they, um, whatever grievance they, will, they are expressing is um, tabled. So it's an honor seeing you on our program. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I will come to you soon. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, let's move to Kefi. Kefi, please unmute yourself and speak. Thank you very much. So Koto should get ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes. I'm talking from Window American Cafe. Uh, I want to thank the presenter, which, is, which I am opportune 
is my brother Ose Mingosa. Brendo, yes. I have a lot of people from here. Yes, yes. I'm from Ugele to be more precise. I have, yeah, I have, I have many, I have many students here watching you live here from Windon America, Kefi. Yes, I've been able to put up their question and now one question together so you can share more. Like the first question is. What does it take an individual to be an activist in this present in the present situation of the country? Because many people they confuse being an activist with being a courtist because they believe that yes, if you're an activist, you must be toggly, you must because this country we don't even have a listing here. Couple from where we are coming from in Delta states, to be more precise. That is question number one. Question number two: what qualifies an individual? for these LBLP programs. Since you've gone, you should be able to tell our audience those things. Thank you very much. Those are my questions we are asking. All right, very briefly, I will say that there are no qualifications for being an activist other than passion to see change happen where you are. And civic engagement empowers people, gives you enablement help you to find purpose for living until you understand why you are on this part of eternity you may never be able to do something strong and right in love it's to discover purpose and to find something that is not right around you and seek to be the change to that issue of concern in, around your where you live for example like my sister from Uyo said in Ugeli we've had a lot of gang fights and killings. That will not stop until we have more amplified voices like you and I going back to say, look at me now. I have similar background with you, but this is how I am using mine. You can turn your source to Paul Shed and become an influence change maker. And so I think that is what you need. What is that issue around you? Could it be the environment is dirty? Yes, if the environment is dirty, can you put yourself together to become a group of young people who want to see the environment clean? And then you take those little actions that become big changes. That's exactly what you need in the first place. To become an IVF is simple. The American consulate we see what you are doing, we find out about what you are doing, and then only them can say, look, we want to develop your leadership, we want to develop your capacity, your competence and capabilities to make change happen where you are or for a larger society. And that has been my own story. Like I said, I went for the election reform committee Nobody was going to pay me to come. There was no by then. Nobody was paying my tea fare. I was going to pay to go. Nobody was going to pay for a hotel for me. I took an action that I thought would help influence the laws in Nigeria to have election reforms. And then I met with Christy Hemberg, who introduced me to Mary Hayes and Elena Schrader. And today I'm an IVLP. Because of those little things I did back in Ugeli, that's why God and grace found me through the hands of these persons. And that's how I became an IVLP. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing that. Uh, let's quickly go to Sokoto. Uh, after Sokoto, we'll go to Abiyo Kuta. Then we'll go to Ikeja, then Kalaba. Uh, good morning. Sokoto, please unmute and speak. Good morning, Mr. Presenter. Good morning, our special guest this morning. Good morning. Um, my, I would like to ask two questions. One of which is this, uh, the issue of being someone to stand in the gap. We discover that there are this issue of fear and threat, most especially from prominent people from that particular community you want to advocate for. I think we lost him. When you try to advocate on the issue of how to deal with- Hello? 
Hello, I think we lost you at a point. Uh, can you uh, make your question very brief? Uh, we don't have much time so that others can also have the opportunity to ask their question. Okay, what I'm saying, the question I'm asking is that, please, issue of advocacy in a community where you want to advocate for, or there's issue of threat over there, more especially from the prominent people within that community. Please, what are the strategies again to employ in order to pass through that? The second question again, that's why I made an example with that issue of drug abuse, for instance. Second issue again is this. We discovered that we're in a political system in Nigeria whereby strength, strength fails an advocate, meaning there are resources needed to undergo a particular project. And when you run down to government for assistance, it becomes an issue. What do we do in this case? Thank you, sir. All right, firstly, let me say that the issue of strategy is not a public discourse. If not, it is no longer strategy. Strategy is what works behind the scene that you apply uh, to see what to get what you want to achieve. But I can tell you uh, shortly that. You must win the goodwill of other people to your causes. That means you must continually engage people to win the goodwill of people to your causes. Uh, many times I've seen a lot of activists go do the things we do and then get counterproductive results because they did not consult enough. And consultation means even consulting with the enemy or not the enemy to say, in nonviolence, we don't use the word enemy, the opponent. But I will tell you for a fact, there are strategies that you can use, but for the sake of this time and this occasion, I may not be willing to share it now. Uh, I, I want to keep it that way because it is strategy and this is not a strategic session. But I can tell you that we've done that severally in Delta. Uh, it doesn't work all of the time. You need a lot of patience, you need a lot of time, but in the long run, it works engaging with these people. So I will share that with you. Um, I'll leave you with my email. You can send me an email on that. But secondly, always embracing government many times makes civil society to lose their voice. And that is what I said to them in Delta. Don't always patronize government because when government see you all of the time, you may become like what they will now call political uh, NGOs. But I believe that engaging with government should be on issues and not from a beggarly point of view. And so, again, you have to win people to your causes, individuals who believe in your causes. I can say before I came into government, most of the things I did, I didn't go for, to government. And now that I'm even in government, many of the things I do is not funded by government. I believe that it has to be the people. And when your vision is strong and right enough, it will only take but some time, it will come to pass. So I, I will give you those answers for the purpose of this occasion. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Abiyokuta, then we'll go to Ikeja. Abiyokuta, over to you. Yes, I'm from Abel. Sir, you have mentioned advocates. Sir, what is the meaning of advocates and how to how do we start advocates? All right. It's simple. When you speak up for something, when you stand up for something, a cause that is not just about you. When you stand up for something that benefits others, you are advocating for the common good. When you stand up to say, we need water in our communities, you are advocating. When you say, we do not want the girl child to be raped, you are advocating. When you say, you need not to blackmail government, but to do your information gathering before taking on an issue with government, you are advocating. When you speak up for a cause, for something 
not just about you, but for the common good of the community, you are an advocate. You are standing up for something that will not just benefit only you, but more people in the community. So advocacy is taking upon yourself responsibility to see change happen where you are and for the greater society. That is what you can start doing. So you begin from where you are, at that American corner that you are, as you are living, at dear deaths around the, 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 the premises, you can start by mobilizing people to say, look, we cannot leave this place dirty. Let us clean up this place. You are already becoming an advocate for uh, uh, cleanliness around your community and where you are. So advocacy is taking upon yourself responsibility to see change happen in your community around your small space that you are. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Ikeja. Ikeja, please unmute yourself and speak. Kalaba, get ready. Okay, we have four questions from Ikeja. So please be patient with us. Number one. Good morning, sir. Morning. Yeah, my name is Chiwazia from American Corner Ikeja. And I want to ask, since you, you as an activist is now in government, how do you handle an issue when the interest of the government is in conflict with the interest of the civil society in the state? For instance, the issue of palliative and the government wants to do it this way and the civil society wants it to be done in this way and there is a conflict of interest. As an activist who is now in government, how do you manage that uh, issue? Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you for this inspiring section. Um, my name is Fidel Miss from um, American Corner Ikeja Center. My own question is, um, as a social entrepreneur, can you please um, enlighten us more on your engagements on that, what you've been doing so far, and what your plans are for those who wish to, you know, part of this, there are different areas of entrepreneurship and all that, coming to see someone who is, um, you know, into what you're doing, and also involving in, in uh, social entrepreneurship. So I want to you know, understand your activities and what your plans are in that regard. Thank you very much for all your doing. Okay, can I take this to so that I don't lose it? Yes, oh. please go ahead. You can take them. We'll go back to Ikeja. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, first and foremost, my role in government is to be an equilibrium. I am like an equilibrium between the government and the governed. And that is civic engagement. When government and the people often have conversation, you have little or no, uh, you eliminate confrontation often. Because before government comes out to say a thing, it would have been a product of engagement with the people. When government engaged with the people, there is better cohesion. And that is what civic engagement does. And so civil society becomes one of the main platforms government engages with the people. And so when government engages with civil society before the issue comes into the public domain, it becomes a shared vision. It becomes a win-win situation for government and the people. And don't forget that the office of the citizen is supreme. The government exists on behalf of the people. They are a trustee. So a government that truly emanates from the people will want to consult with the citizens. But again, I know that many times, even in our homes, what the father wills or thinks is the best alternative to an issue may not be the way the mother and the children want. And sometimes government provides leadership in giving direction. So what do we do? We become advocates of the people. We take government to the people and we take the people to government and then we find a common ground. And often that is what we do with citizens' budget in Delta State. When the budget of Delta State is to be made, the people are first of all consulted. It is not top bottom, it is bottom to the top. The people tell us based on the needs they have in their communities, what they think government should do. Government assess these positions and look at the reality of being able to carry out this project at that given time. And the government goes back to the people and says, look, you have just said we should build a road. That road you're asking us to build may take three budgets of the state to be able to accomplish. Now we may not be able to build that road, but we can be able to get this palliative for this. It becomes a shared conversation. So 
The reason why government get people like us into government, uh, the act of governance for civic engagement is to serve as a bridge between the government and the governed, and not to guard the voice of the people and not to to, to, to stifle them, not to shrink the civic space, but to expand it to ensure that the people's voice is what matters. And so that is exactly what we have been doing in Delta State and has been working. It does not mean that there will not be issues of confrontation here and there, but then we have a model of being able to resolve them before it gets out of hand. i give you for example, recently, the issue of palliative came and somebody wrote, that government and eating the money for the palliative in Delta State. I will say, no, you have not consulted government. You have the freedom of information uh, 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 law in Delta State. You have the Office of the City Engagement in Delta State. You also have the OGP operational in Delta State. You should have used all of this mechanism to get your information before coming to the pub to the public space. But in any case, the government will not be hard on you because we know that you are working for the good of society. We took the issues before the SSG and the SSG made a public statement showing to citizens what the state of the palliative is. And I can tell you, I am not part of that process, ensuring that the palliative coming to data state had a human face. So that is exactly what we do. We get the civil society to become actors for the good of the people. They monitor what government does, and then it becomes easier for a win-win for everybody. Then secondly, on the issue of social entrepreneurship, I'm a musician. Many times we use music as a tool to engage with the people. In the days coming, I'm going to be having a concert, and the concert will be about av on advocacy for the sustainable development goals. For the 17 goals, we are going to be looking for a song to sing as a way of enlightening people, as a way of showing to the people that the global goals should be localized. So I use music, for example, as something that I do to engage with, with the people. And so that is my journey on social entrepreneurship, using music as a tool, using creative arts as a tool. And then we do not seek for money in doing so. Uh, one of the ways I did many years ago was when one of the consular officers was being transferred out of America, uh, out of Lagos, I came with a band to come and perform there for free, all the way from Delta State, we performed. And that is exactly what we've been doing, creating possibilities, developing talents, and using those talents to advance advocacy for the good of the people. Thank you. Uh... Ikeja, your last question. Good morning. My name Good morning. Is, my name is Emmanuel from American Corner Ikeja. My first question is, as an activist, have you had a project you have, you have in mind to carry out? And in this, it got to a point, some people around you it does not, it's something that doesn't favor them. And the pressure becomes so much that you thought about giving up on the project. That's the first. And the second question is, have you been in a situation whereby you have associates around you where you, you trust so much and because of the pressure people are piling up, they decide to use them against you? Thank you very much. That will be all from Ikeja. For now, please um, let let us get other question in so that you can just respond and we make progress. Um, let's take a question from Kalaba. Kalaba, quickly make it very short and brief. Then after Kalaba, we'll take Enugu. After Enugu, we'll go to uh, Kano. Then we'll go back to Benin, and Makado will be the last. Quickly. All right. So my question is about drug abuse because you were saying something about drug and substance in, 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 in abuse in the Niger Delta and Lagos region. So, so I want to ask about like creative ways to, to help stop drug, drug abuse in most of this region, most especially in Lagos state, because it has been like a pressing issues and, and we can see that governmental aid like are not doing um, anything to help stop this. So what are like the creative ways that you have employed to stop drug abuse in these regions? Thank you. Well, well, I will not be able to say that I've had creative ways to stop drug abuse so far, but I know that we are making effort thinking 
deeper. But one of the re- one of the ways I think we can actually deal with this is to use our social influencers. Uh, the people that we see as influencers actually promote drugs. When you see them, they are always, uh, almost always, so to say, uh, showing the imagery of one big cigar and uh, talking slimy like one who is on drugs, like evil cigar to glorify uh, uh, drugs. And so until we're able to become influencers or make them to become influencers in the right direction, to become the advocates against drugs, uh, I think that's one of the ways. And that's why when I saw that there are Mali visited, is it NDLA? It was positive for me if he can become one of the influencers to speak against drugs because they have a lot of followership. I would also like to see Portable becoming an influencer against drug abuse. And every one of them that we believe have a lot of followership can become influence makers, can even write a song and sing together to dissuade people from drugs. I, I think that's another way that we can begin this journey. And so this also can be done in our local environment, influence leaders in our environment coming to speak against drugs and coming to speak against the menace of East and hold more interaction with the young people. And it should not be a condemnation of our young people because I see many times we are judgmental. And when we become judgmental with the way young people do these things, they become resentive. They, they resent uh, at what we say to them and it will become more hardened. So these are the areas where we are looking at to handle the issues of drugs and uh, the issue of gang fights, also known as cultism, that is ravaging and offending lives in this region. Uh, we, we are working on that. Because, thank you so, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to Inugu, then uh, we'll take Kanu. Inugu, over to you. He's on mute. Come on, please, sir. Very brief. Okay, um, I have two questions, but I'll make it as brief as possible. Number one, uh, do you think that poverty has a role to play in youth activism? Because um, there's a saying in, down here in the East that is person that has eaten very well that can fight. So do you think that the fact that youths, many youths are living in abject poverty, do you think it has a contribution towards their apathy to social engagement. Then secondly, uh, you said that most of the times that the government engages the people before they bring out policies. What happens in Nigeria, because there is diff- there's a difference between what it ought to be and what it is. What it is in Nigeria is that government hardly engages the people before they bring out rules. The first subsidy that was removed was removed on the day of the inauguration. No engagement, nothing happens. And despite everything that has been done to call the attention of the government, they have refused. What do we now do when government refuses to engage and when they victimize the people, especially what is going on in Enugu State, where people are, people's shops are being closed because they refuse to open and sit at home? I know that it is wrong for the government to come and close people's shop because they refuse to open shops, not government offices. So what have you to say about this, sir? Thank you. Well, uh, clearly, poverty does not have anything to do against activism. For me, I should think the hungrier you are, the more agitated you should be because you are faced with dire consequences. They say in our balance, for Pigeon say, uh, he that is done, I've been a pigeon. He that is done, need fear no fall. You know, uh, if you talk, you die. If you don't talk, you die. So let me just talk and die. And again, biblically, my best scripture is, uh, I think, First King chapter 7. It said, The four lepers said, If we sit down here, we will die. But if we move, we may die. I mean, paraventure, we may leave. So you, and I think that is why Martin Luther King. Uh, might have drawn is, I'm not saying that is exactly what it is, but could have drawn his uh, 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 inspiration from what he said, by all means, keep moving. I think that our people need to know that 
our lives begin to end, like Martin Luther King Jr. said, begin to end the day we keep quiet, we are silent on the things that matters. Until we speak up for something greater than us, we are not living, we are just existing. So I think we need to let our people know that regardless of how many times government stands against us, it is the will of the people that should be supreme. We must not abdicate that. We must not let that die. And I also think that we need to encourage ourselves as citizens because the government is about citizens. Many times, the annihilation between government and the people is also dependent on our approach. I know in this part of the world, lobbying is not as strong as it is. It is maybe the United States, and I think that's one area we need to develop in Nigeria. But we also need to understand the art of engaging to lobby to get things done. Many times, it is not all about confrontation. It's about engagement. It's about bringing your issues to the table. And sometimes, you will not get it the way you want it. You have to consistently be persistent in seeking to see change happen incrementally. And I think that was what Moses did over time. Let my people go. It did not happen once. It did not happen immediately. He said so. He kept on to the cause, fighting for it, working on it, engaging on it, and he got what he needed at the end of the day. And so even after getting it, they still came after him. The internal vigilance of the people is key. And again, for the government of Enugu State, I think more engagement engaging officers of government, engaging your House of Assembly members, engaging your councillors, talking with them. Do not annihilate them. Don't see them as your enemies, but see them as developmental partners that must see progress together, even though sometimes we see it differently. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Kano. Kano, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. My question here is that do you have a certain suggestion on our use? If you take a look nowadays, our use in Nigeria has a certain mindset of even if they follow the rules and regulations, or if they don't, they can succeed, they can achieve their own goals. Even if they follow those rules and regulations, it is just a waste of time since the government cannot follow all the code of conduct of governing them. So do you have a certain suggestion for them, particularly the use and also to the government to the solution of this problem? That is all. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't really get you well, but I, I think what you have just said, if I get you correctly, is that we must continue to engage. And it is my advocacy that government across the state create the opportunity for citizens to have a civic engagement department in their state. It will not come all of a sudden, but the civil society should engage government, write to them on the need to engage civil society much more better. They must not see the civil society as enemies. They must not see citizens influencers as enemies. They must not see people speaking or being critical of government as enemies, but as partners who want to see greater good for the people. And then on our part as citizens advocates, we must not lie against government, not show malice or try to blackmail government as a tool of engagement. That creates a lot of division and gaps. We must show the willingness to see that what we actually seek is not ego-seeking uh, activism, but desire to see change happen. If I got you correctly, uh, that is what I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think there's a, another question from Kanu. Kanu, quickly, unmute yourself and speak. OK, thank you so much, sir. You actually spoken well. I just have one question now. As an activist, you've actually done research on your society and you've actually seen, okay, one of two things you want to correct, one of two things you want to change. Now, I want to know, what are your advice? You know, you said something, there's a saying that says, if you want to go fast, if you are going alone, you go fast. But if you want to go with people, you go far. 
So now I want to know how do you engage people like you? How do you do this engagement whereby you bring people together? What are your advice as someone that I've seen and you want to advise the person on how to engage people so that this change can actually come fast and this change can actually be fruitful? So what are your advice if you, if you are given a chance like now to advise and I've seen something, what are your advice? What can you tell the person? The mistakes he should not make, things he should do, things he should not do in the process of trying to do something like this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, like I said, it's a long walk to freedom, like uh, our sage Nessie Mandela said in his book. It's a long walk to freedom. It's not a quick fix. It's not a dash. Uh, it, it's something is, you can consider a marathon. You must continue to build networks of friendship around yourself, people of similar ideas. And that's why we call it interest community. What do you people seek to see? Do you seek to see change in legislation? Do you seek to see change in government policy? Do you seek to see change in how our communities are, uh, are being run? You have to begin to organize yourself and begin to speak within the space of what you have. Could it be writing a the house member to a local government chairman, uh, writing letters to other bigger organizations to help you amplify your voice. Uh, these are a lot of ways you can do as you begin to engage. When I started, I started engaging with senior citizens who I feel are influential in the local area. We go to them and tell them what our thinking is and appeal to them to speak to government. We put it on newspapers. Rex Anigoro engages Fred Majemite, speaks on the need for cleanliness in Ukele North. We have passed our message. We, more people we know about what we are doing. So we started organizing ourselves within our little area of strength and engaging local leaders in, the, in those areas. I think you can begin from there. And then as you begin to gain strength, your strategy begins to change and expand. So I think, first and foremost, look around your, your friends. How many of them have same thoughts like you? That is where you form a group of interest for the good of the people. Start from that place and then you can begin. Thank you so much. Let's go to Benin City. Benin after Benin City will take Makodi. Makodi will be our last, uh, our last space to speak. Well, let's go to Benin. Benin City, please unmute yourself and speak. We can't hear you, Benicity. We still cannot hear you, Benicity. Makodi, get ready. Belize City, we understand you are having some technical challenge there. Um, Makodi, are you ready? Yes. Please unmute yourself and speak. Why we wait for the next city? Good morning, sir. My question is: We have stubborn voice in a society. What well, in a society who have been who have caused a lot of damage to economic, social, and human rights of people? Now they are saying the words honesty. What would you as a civil rights person in government advice to anyone or a group that is willing to step into the process of reconciling these people with government for peace and freedom. Okay. You talked about bad boys and uh, amnesty. 
Of, of all right. I think that um, in a dose state presently, the issue of courtesy is very serious. Uh, the last no. time I, I heard the governor speak about. Hello. Uh, hello. Go ahead. Bini City, um, hold on. Go ahead and speak. I heard the governor in a dose state speak about death uh, through courtesy and all of that. I think amnesty is a welcome development for those who are willing to change and then be able to rehabilitate them to become change agents who speak up against those vices that they've also been involved in. I think for every one of us, at one time or the other, we've been through that situation uh, in our process of growing. And that's why uh, I, I remember a message preached uh, by T.D. Jake sometime the bad boy, but the bad boys and the God who loved them. I think that that is a welcome development. But amnesty should not be a means to hide behind government legality to continue to perpetuate worse crimes. Uh, we have seen that also people take up amnesty just to make use it as a cover. And that is why the need to also monitor the activities of these persons becomes very, very, very important. When people commit themselves to a cause to say, we do not want to do this anymore, but we need government protection because in the past we have done very bad things, then they must be given rehabilitation over time and they'll be watched, their growth, their development and process also be watched. I, 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 I was a trader in the amnesty program in, uh, um, when in the wake of the amnesty, uh, I joined the Foundation of Ethic Harmony of, in Nigeria, led by Barista Alenu Yema, to train those uh, record as agitators, uh, to disarm them and also to show them how nonviolence and peace building can work. And that is why in the days coming, I'm going to embark on nonviolence education in churches, in schools, everywhere, so that people get this understanding as a means of civic education for the people. So I think it's a good development. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Sita, are you ready for us now? Yes, me, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now, sir? Um, Denise, yeah. Sita, are you ready for us? Yes, we are ready. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, we can hear loud and clear. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. My name is good Julius afternoon. from Denise City Window on America. I just, I just want to ask a question that what are challenges you pass through as a civil society organization before you get to this position? Because I know that you used to fight for people's rights. So most times, like civil society organizations, they, they normally have problem with police, MUPU, and soldiers, because most times when these ones wanted to extort the people, so they always come to their rescue and rescue people from the hands of these authorities. So, to say. so how do you now pass through all these challenges and get to this position where you are today? Because I know that you must have been having loggerheads with probably police, mopos, and all that, like that. So I wanted to know how you were able to pass through and make it and get to this position where you are today so that if anybody wanted to imitate you, we will know the best route to follow. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Uh, in Delta State, for example, I've had elderly people I've been working with. One of them is here with us. Uh, Dikinoke Zodugala uh, 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 is a very good example of leadership when it comes to uh, the civil to civic space. Many times, for those of us who are younger, we go to Dikinoke Zodugala, who is a voice of moderation in our engagement, and I give tribute to him for being here today. Uh, what I would say to you, Benin was my second home until recently. I lived in Benin. I was born in Benin. I stood in Ekwoma. So you can see that Edo State is a place that I am very close to and it's dear to my heart. Uh, many times, engaging what is wrong does not have to be confrontational. I think we miss it all of the, many of the time, but we think that it has to be confrontational in our approach to issues. I believe there are more and better ways to engage before getting to the issue of direct action. Uh, we were taught that we must apply the three Cs. We must consult, we must consolidate before we confront. Many times, we do not use these approaches. We just go to confront. And many times we do not do our advocacy on the issue. 
to let people know who we are, what we stand for, enough. And we know sometimes that, yes, in our society, we could have bad eggs everywhere, both on the part of the civil society, on the part of government, the part of the security agencies. We must find a common ground for a win-win situation. It helps us better. It helps us in saving us from losses of lives and all of that. And so I think that uh, in our advocacy, in our activism, we must always engage. Engagement becomes a tool that helps us have a common ground. We may not always have the common ground, but then it would have been exhaustive. The, Moses said, let my people go, let my people go before he brings on the plague. The plague was not always the first thing he, he brought. He engaged first. He sought to be heard. He sought to have the space to get his opinion across to the people in authority. I think this is one area that I have learned to work on in my engagement. And so uh, I think when we do that, we can win much more. Except we are doing our advocacy or activism for ego. We want to show that we don't fear anybody. Anybody talk to anyhow, to us anyhow, you go see anyhow. No, I think activism has gone beyond that. It is about bringing the results that you seek. The method cannot be bigger than the goal. The goal is always greater than the role. But I see sometimes my colleagues, they just want to show that I be activist. I be activist. Let me go talk to that police officer. I don't go talk to them. He must come here to the people. And all of those ego. And I say to them, no, that it doesn't work that way anymore. There must be a win-win situation. You must have humanity. You must not seek to humiliate the other man because he was wrong. It is not a man that is the evil. It is the issue that you seek to correct. You know, I think that should be our approach. Capacity building program in our approaches, in our strategy, is something we must keep on doing. And I think I recommend this for all of us to use in our, in our groups to, when we engage. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any question in Benin City? One last question from Benin City, then we go. Um, good, good afternoon, sir. I just want to ask what happens when action is violence? What we can't hear you. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me Hello? now, sir? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Please want to ask what happens when. What do you do when activism meets violence, like what happened in Lagos at um, Lekki Main Gates during NSAS protests? What led, what happened to be a peaceful protest ended at a, in, in a very tragic matter? What do you do when something like that happens? And how do you motivate the people around you to, um, to join you in activism when the only when most of the youths think, uh, of today think about themselves, think about only themselves. All right, I think that um, apathy sets in when the pursuit of an agenda fails, uh, and people are withdrawn. Uh, and I think again, it is because most of the time, our activism here is spontaneous. It is not a product of um, um, long-term engagement. What we were taught is that activism is not a dash. It is something you build upon over time. I keep referring to Moses many times because it seems to be a model for me. Moses was called for a cause, but he wanted to achieve it in his own time, at his, with his own strength, without developing himself enough. What happened to him? He ran away from to Egypt. He was pursued because they saw him kill someone. I think that is the story. And, and, and he, he got himself prepared and came back with better tools of engagement. When there is apathy, what we do is to go back to the drawing board and keep on retraining ourselves. And that is why the issue of capacity building is important for all of us. We must keep on building our capacity. We must keep on looking at the tools that we use in engaging and look at what, how useful are they for the condition or for the situations we want to apply them. A particular strategy that works in Lagos may not work in Delta State. 
your terrain of engagement is also very, very important. Don't say, oh, you have used it in Agbaru and it worked for her. So I'm going to use it in Ole. And you begin to sing, Odero now, Awao, Midero well, Awao, Awao, Awao. No, you don't do that. There are different strategies to getting these things done. And so we must always retool. We must always rebuild our capacity and increase our knowledge in the strategy, techniques, and uh, 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 trends that we use. Not always the other Romel and one strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rex Nigoro. Thank you so <laughs> much. Uh, that, was, that was actually exciting to hear you pronounce yeah. some of that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a very wonderful time. Let's put our hands together for Rex. Yes. Before I go, I want to call uh, the American corner to please support us in Delta State to have an American corner in Delta State. I want to see this dream come to pass in my time as a senior special assistant to the governor on civic engagement and civil society. So I'm calling on the public affairs, the U.S. mission in Nigeria, to help us ensure that we have uh, the American corner in Delta State. I am hopeful that this dream will come to pass. And then we, I will invite all of you to Delta, to the American corner in Delta State, where we have a time of engagement. I also want to say, that I call on all governments in Nigeria to have somebody in civic engagement and in civil society that can help build capacity of young people, build citizenship, and help people engage government much more better. And I call on the presidency of uh, Tunibu to do so at the national level so that we can have who to engage with on behalf of government, especially like the man from Enugu said, when policies are about to be made. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I know that the government of Delta State will be proud that one of their own, Rex and Igoro, is doing this at this time. And we have a much more amplified, empowered communities, empowered citizens. Thank you so much, Rex. Thank you so much. It's been quite a very exciting moment. And indeed, we are so delighted that out of your busy schedule, you were able to uh, come on our program today. And indeed, I must say that you have been one of the most fascinating uh, young personality that we have seen on our program. And indeed, we're very, Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. We, I believe uh, everything you have said today has been very loud and clear for a lot of our young people to understand what our civic engagement entails and how they can some of them who are actually inspired by your thoughts will actually uh, be able to find a way forward uh after this conversation today thank you so much for coming on thank you program. very much we yeah i, I will fail to say I, I will fail to say for seven years we celebrate the citizens and civil society day in delta state every year December 14th is set aside as Citizens Day and Civil Society Day in Delta State to celebrate the work of active citizens working for the good of society. And that is one of the things I can say has been my legacy because I became an IVLP. Thank you so much. I, I love the way you, you you keep singing the praise of IVLP and indeed we're very proud of you. Thank you so much for the great work you are doing. Uh, Samuel, Thank do you, you have an announcement for us? I just want to thank, um, I want to thank Rex, Rex for coming on this program. Um, for us all, please thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward to Monday. And I want everyone to be aware of the program that we have. Please, let's share the programs. Let's make sure that we are able to pull in more people to listen to people like Rex. Thank you, everybody. Hoping to see you on Monday. Rex, I'm bye. coming to your school very soon. Lagos, Abuja, Makodi, Uyo. Okay. Expect me on visit to all the centers very soon. Thank no you problem. very much. Thank, Thank you, you Adidana. Thank you all. Bye.
Thank Bye. you. I am coming to Lagos now. I'm driving to Ikeja. For the participants there, please wait for me. I'll give you a handshake. I'm close yeah. to you now. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye, you. everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.